You know, I love worship. When you think about worship, not only do we worship in the songs, when we sing the hymns, we, we come ready to give praise. It's not about what we get when we come to church to worship. It's what we give, and we give praise. So not only in just the singing, but also in the preaching and the learning of the, you know, the Word of God, it is how we praise God with our whole heart when we uh, learn. It's not just about what we receive, it's about what we get. Uh, Sister Emily, are we good back there? If, uh, if you would, turn your Bibles with me. The Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Today we're going to praise the Lord and we're going to look at the Word of God and worship and learn some endless truth, the God's truth. The message today is God's sacrifice and the sinner's substitute. God's sacrifice and the sinner's substitute. Now, it's a little bit of a lengthy passage, which we're going to look at in Genesis chapter 22. We're going to look at verse 1 through 18, and most of us will be familiar with the passage. But I want us, as we read, to just keep a couple things in your mind as we read. First, look for God's sacrifice and look for the sinner's substitute. Now, this, this historical account, which we'll read, will have a, a couple different types of Christ, types of redemption, types of the sinner under condemnation, and types of the Lamb of God, which we'll look at. And, and So as we read through it, perhaps those things will pop out at you, and we're going to talk a little bit more about those things. But let's look at verse one of chapter 22. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt or tried Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, notice what he says to his young men, Abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and what? Come again to you. Now, the way that Abraham understood it in verse 2 was he told him to go offer Isaac for a burnt offering. That meant death. But Abraham, what does he say to his young men here? He's confident that when he returns, he'll be returning with Isaac even though the angel had told him, or God had told him, to kill him. So we'll look a little bit more at that, just something to take note of, that Abraham believed that Isaac would still live. In verse 6, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here, Am I my son? And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeking thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram, caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and looked, and took the ram, and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. 
And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is written to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven a second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come this morning, Father, we're worshiping you, thanking you, Father, for your grace, your goodness to us, though we do not deserve it. Father, we ask forgiveness of our sins and where we fail Father, may we glorify you, may we praise you this morning through the word of God. May you touch each heart here. Father, may you be honored in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. There's basically three great truths in the word of God. There's the truth about God, there's the truth about man, and there's the truth about salvation. Now, we can go for many, many weeks, months, eternity, talking about all of God's goodness and His characteristics. But we need to understand the Word of God is God's revealed truth to us about Him. It's not man's writing, it's God's writing. God used man to write the revelation that He has intended to tell you and me about Him. And what it tells me, it tells me about God, It tells me about man, and it tells me about salvation. So the first thing that we want to look at today is we want to see the truth about God. We know that God is holy. The Bible reveals that he's holy and to be worshipped. In Psalm 99, 9, it says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. God is gracious, he's righteous, and he's merciful. And he says, "Glory or gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful in Psalm 116. The Bible says that God is infinite and he self-exists. And he is before all things and by him all things consist in Colossians 117. God is immutable. That means he does not change in Malachi 3.6. It says, for I am the Lord, I change not. God is self-sufficient. God has no needs. He says, for as the Father hath life in himself. He has the very life in himself. He has no needs in John 5, 26. God is wise. He is full of perfect understanding. He's omniscient. He's omniscient, and that means complete knowledge. He's unchanging in his wisdom. In Romans 11, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. God is faithful. I love that, uh, that hymn we had today. God is faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. He is infinitely unchanging and true. In Deuteronomy 7, 9, it says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God. The faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments for a thousand generations. And another thing we know from the word of God is God is good. Psalm 34, 8, it says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Um, Life is good. When you trust in the Lord, life is good because God is good. God is glorious and just. In Deuteronomy 32, 4, he says, He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right, he is. God has communicated through us throughout history with the various different types of ways. We know that. We see that for an example. And then Hebrews 1.1, he tells us that. He summarizes that God who at sundry times and in diverse, and diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, but hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. In the new covenant, we see God speaking, revealing his truth 
through His Son, and whom He hath appointed the heir of all things. The God who is God of the Old Testament has appointed Christ the heir of all things. He's done speaking through prophets. Today He speaks through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so God, can He's not speaking through a priest on earth. He's speaking to our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we have access to. God cannot dwell with sin. Now this is important. This is a very important characteristic about God. He cannot dwell with sin. He can't have it near Him. He can't have it in His holy presence. He can't have wickedness anywhere in Him. I mean, anywhere in heaven. Nowhere near Him. It says, Psalm 5, 4, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in iniquity and wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. Remember those words. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. Which brings us to our second point, the truth about man. We saw the truth about God, now we see the truth about man. The truth about man is man was created by God. In his image to fulfill the design which God had created him. You know God in all his creation had a design intended for his creation to fulfill. And the, 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 whatever he created does not bring him glory if it's not fulfilling the design <laughs> that he created him to do. That, you know, a man who's not worshiping God, thankful to God, loves God, is not bringing glory to God, and he's not fulfilling the design by which God created him. We're all created. I love that. If you look at the bottom of your foot, it should say, made by God. Why, why did God design you? To love you. Why did he create you? That you could love him, be thankful, and that's what Romans chapter 1 says, and worship him as God and obey him. But we have fallen. This is the truth about man. We started that way, but then Adam fell, and then curse came upon us. God created us to have faculties of rationale and will. If you look at all the other creation, God has not put rationale and a will, a soul, and breathe a soul into them as he did us. God has made us a trichotomy. Now, I'm not going to you know, argue with you if you're dichotomy or, or trichotomy, but I believe God has made us body, soul, and spirit. And the Bible reveals that sin has warped God's creation and all the faculty of its being. It's like putting on a pair of glasses, sunglasses, and all you see is sin that we see that sin has warped God's creation. Um, the imagination of man. It says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. Now, what was the thing I told you to remember? Remember what one of the, the attributes, characteristics of God has revealed to us that God that evil will not dwell with God. Look at man. Our imagination's even evil. The thoughts of our hearts was only evil continually. Our motives, Jeremiah 17 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Our very nature, in Psalm 51, it says, behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Our value." Our core worth before God today, if you're not in Him, if you're, if you're not trusting in Him as your Savior, if you're not born again, Ephesians 2, chapter 1 says you're dead. You're dead in sins and trespasses. There's no life in you. There's no pleasing God. It's just a slow march to death, and after this, the judgment. And you will be judged by how you have obeyed the law problem is, is you haven't. And the penalty of that is death. Everlasting death. So our standing before God today, if you're not saved, Romans chapter 3, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, that's the truth about man. And if we take the truth about God and the truth about man, we have a problem here, don't we? Because the truth about God is he, that evil cannot dwell with him. And the truth about man is that we are desperately evil. How are we going to dwell with God? That brings us to our need. 
That brings us to the truth about salvation, the third truth, the need. Because of the truth of man, because of the truth of God, we see from the word of God that God is gracious, he's merciful, he is just and forgiving us of our sins through the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. That God has provided himself a way for you to be saved. The righteousness which God requires to enter into his glory, he's provided to you. It's not for me to discover. It's not for me to figure out how to please God. It's not for me to figure out how to become righteous and not wicked before God so I can go to heaven, so I can be in God's presence, so I can have a happy life and not a continual disappointment every day of being a criminal against God, disappointing God. How can I please God? And what the most beautiful thing in all of the universe and all the world is, is God has provided a way to do it. Not only has He provided His Son a sacrifice at Calvary, but God calls you to Him. He's not only laid out the table of nourishment, but He brings me to it. He brings me to it. I was not seeking God. I was not seeking to be saved. I didn't care about the truth about God. I didn't care about the truth about man. But one day the Lord energized my heart and, and he put a fear in me and said, Philip, you better care. You better care because if you die the day, you will die and you will perish in your sins, separated from God, separated from any kind of paradise, and you will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And the word of God says it. It says it over and over, and he means it. It's true. That's a lot to ignore. That's a lot to ignore if that's true. If it's true. Can you imagine eternity in a lake of fire? In Deuteronomy, it says the Lord our God is God. He is God. And what he says is true. This is what God has revealed to you. This is what God has revealed to us, the truth about God, about him. Well, let's look more about salvation, the truth about salvation. God's plan for my salvation was eternal and completed in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It says in Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Well, our God is rich. He is rich, beyond richness. We can look at creation. We can look at all things. We can look through the history of time, and we can see how rich our God is. But he is rich in mercy. That means that you are not evil enough for God to save. You are not, you know, you are not too far gone. Some people think they're too far gone, and other people think they're, they're, they're too good to be saved. That there's nothing wrong with them. They're doing fine. Isn't it sad how many people just feel like they're good enough? As long as they don't kill anybody or do any kind of heinous crime... But the word of God says no matter how good you think you are, you've already been passed the sentence of condemned. You're condemned already. That's what Jesus said in his earthly ministry. I've come not to condemn the world. The world is condemned already. It's already condemned. You just have to do nothing. You're already on that path. But Ephesians 2.8, we know this one. For by grace are you saved through faith. Grace is God giving you a gift that you did not deserve and that you did not earn. I didn't deserve God's grace. I didn't deserve his gift. I didn't earn his gift. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a gift. It wouldn't be a gift of grace. I didn't earn it. You know, and what's interesting, I try to illustrate this. I try to bring this to an earthly, re, you know, kind of example or re reality. It's like me giving, uh, you know, one of my children $100. And not because they did any chore or not anything like that or not anything like that. And I did not give the other child $100. I just, here you go, here's $100. Now, they didn't deserve it. They didn't earn it. But it doesn't really equate in the illustration because I still love my child. I'm still going to give my child. So you can say in a way that they deserved it because they were already a child. But the Bible says when we were enemies, 
When we had no strength, when we were enemies of the cross, Christ gave His life, His blood, that He became a ransom, that He ransomed me out. And by His grace, He saved me. Not only did I not deserve it, but I was His enemy when He gave. Um, Mark chapter 1, verse 15 says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's salvation. The need for salvation. If you take the truth about God and the truth about man, man, then you must see that there's a need to be saved. The reception of salvation is in the heart. The declaration of salvation that it must be preached and taught. Uh, men and women must be told of their condition. It's not a popular sermon. Uh, you know, as this gets broadcasted out at Facebook, I'm sure there's many who would be offended to know that God does not think um, as much about you that you do. Yeah. A lot of people are offended about that. But we must come to the understanding we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We all are in need of salvation. There's, there's no getting out of this ourselves. There's no... You know, as, as doing good works. There's, you can give to the angel tree or whatever it is. You can give to charity. You can do all kinds of things. Now, I believe that, you know, uh, as far as the church goes, that the church gives to the community. The church gives because we need to look at when we give, who gets the glory? The God needs to get the glory no matter what we give. So when it's done in the name of the church, it's a lot more likely to bring God glory and not an individual person glory. So, that being said, that, that was kind of, I digress, that when we uh, go out and we preach and teach the Word of God, you know, I very much doubt that Joel Olstein would have his huge Texas church if he actually preached the truth of the Bible and the implication to mankind and the truth about God and the truth about salvation, the truth about heaven, the truth about hell, that he is, you know, he's going out and he's, it's dangerous, I'm duty-bound to declare the whole counsel of God. You know, uh, we were at King's Island yesterday. Uh, I was uh, with Jason, and we were, you know, I uh, was uh, chaperoning and for a group that he was with, and you just see all these people at King's Island. And, you know, they would believe you me more if I were to say, there's fire coming. There's fire. There's, there's, there's a fire in the beast. If, if, if I were to warn them, there's a storm coming. There's a storm. There's a lightning storm coming. We all need to flee. We all need to go. They would believe me more about that than they would about me standing up and preaching and saying, God's wrath and His vengeance is coming upon all the world. It's coming upon you individually. God hates sin. He cannot, be, uh, he cannot dwell with sin. Be saved today. Repent today. The kingdom of God is at hand. And you know, it breaks my heart because that's what happened to Lot. Lot's own family thought he was joking. Thought he was just kidding around. That, they, that, that he was mocking. God, Lot was saying, no, the Lord's bringing fire and brimstone to Sodom and Gomorrah. He is bringing it. And they were like, whatever, you're crazy. Stop messing them with us. And finally he got them to leave and then Lot's wife turned with a, in affection towards the old life that she had. And that's... And you know, it, it hurts our heart, doesn't it? It grips our heart that here's this matter of eternal life and death and we love our children and we want them to be saved and we're trying to warn them. But they won't listen. It's the Lord that must save. A person will never care about salvation until God has shown them they're in danger. You're not going to care to be saved if you don't know you're in danger. You must be shown. That's the truth about man, the truth about God, the truth about salvation. We see sin entered. And what did God do? God had established a way temporarily in the Old Testament how sins could be forgiven. This was through sacrifice. 
God demanded early on the implementation of sacrifice. So for sins to be forgiven in the, in the Old Testament, we see God uh, bring up this system of priest, and then we see that God gave specific instructions there in the tabernacle and there the Holy of Holies and the way that God, the way that God's priest on earth were to administer sac- uh, sacrifices that it had to be specific to the instructions of God. When they could do it, how they could do it, who could do it. Uh, and if any of those instructions were, were taken uh, for granted or they presumed to do it their own way like Aaron's sons did or any of those things, God was wrong. He got mad and he took them out. You will not mar the type of Christ that is to come. And so Christ, or God had set up this, this institution of sacrifices in Leviticus 17.11. You don't have to turn there. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. It's in the blood, and, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. It's the blood, it's the innocent blood that must make an atonement, a covering to where God receives that sacrificial uh, gift and He ignores or He, he forgets, forgives your sins. But we see in Hebrews chapter 9 that Christ was the better uh, covenant. Christ was the better priest. Christ was the better sacrifice. Everything in Hebrews, Christ is better. And uh, look at Hebrews chapter, well, there's a couple places that we can look in Hebrews. Chapter 9 and chapter 10. Well, I love, the, I love to get excited when I talk about the, you know, what God has done for us. And I hope that you get excited and we just... It's worship, it's uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, <laughs> just thinking about it, I, I got lost trying to find Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1, then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Uh, Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, just once a year, not without blood. There must have been blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which uh, were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscious. Now look at Hebrews chapter 10. I'm sorry, verse, no, no stay there where, where we're at. In verse 11 of chapter 9, but Christ being come, a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Uh, If you look at chapter 10, verse 15, it says, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, For after that he said before, this is a covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. 
and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. I'm telling you, today we are able to be saved, that God has given us the gift of reconciliation. That means though we do know the truth about man and how our hearts are, it says the imagination of our hearts are evil continually and that we're not holy, but God has provided himself a lamb. And that's, I don't know if we're going to have time to go into the specifics. That that was kind of the introduction (laughs) because I wanted to get to Abraham and Isaac to how God's sacrifice and the sinner's substitute. God has provided both. God has provided himself a lamb. And if you remember, Isaac was like, Father, I see the wood. I see all of these things. We're getting ready to sacrifice before God. Where's the sacrifice? And what did Abraham say? Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And just as Abraham went to slay Isaac, an angel stopped him, and he said, and behind him, what was caught in the thicket? A ram. God had provided a lamb to take the place of Isaac. And that's what has happened today. Instead of me paying for my sins, my iniquity, my, uh, all of my transgressions against God that I have broken the law, what did God do? God says, well, Philip, you deserve to die. That's what the Holy Bible says. That's what God's revelation says. You deserve to die and perish and go to hell. Now, I'm going to die. I, that's my road. That's, what I'm going, that's what's going to happen to me. But what happens? God provides a lamb. And he says, Philip, move over. You're free to go. He untied Isaac. He unbound Isaac and he let him go. And what did he do? He sacrificed the lamb in the place of Isaac. And what happened? What did God do for me? God sacrificed Jesus. He poured out his wrath upon Jesus. His own son whom he provided, and he let me go. I'm unbound. I'm untied. I'm just like Isaac. Jesus is God's sacrifice. But you know what? Jesus is my substitute. Instead of me, it was Christ who died upon Calvary. Oh, he went willingly. There was a miracle. You know, I'm not a microbiologist, but I know a microbiologist. And he just loves the beauty and the creation of just the planets and or not the planets but the plants and everything small and he's saying just the beauty of it the wonder of the design of it i'm not an astrophysicist i sometimes wish i was but i know an astrophysicist and they study about the wonder and the beauty of creation that God, he created gravity, not in a hundred years, but like this. And gravity's been obeying God ever since. And he just, the wonder and the beauty that God created. You know what? If you're saved today, and you read the word of God, and you look at salvation, it should be wondrous and beautiful to you, and just makes you want to worship and praise God. Think about that for a minute. Think about how worthy Jesus is worth to be praised. Think about heaven. You know what we're going to be doing in heaven? We're going to be praising the Lamb of God. It gives us a scene in Revelation. Worthy. And they sing a new song. Thou art worthy to receive honor and glory and power and honor. For thou hast created, all things hast created, and all things that has created. Now look, for ever. We're going to be praising the Lamb of God. We're going to be praising the name of Jesus. We're going to be praising glory. Now take that scene forever and ever and ever. Now take that and work work your way backwards. Now understand that's going to happen. 
forever and ever. I'm not going to be praising me. I'm not going to be praising you. I'm not going to be thanking you. I'm not going to be, we're not going to be worshiping each other. We're only going to be worshiping one, the Lord God, and only Him. Now think about that. Now work your way backwards. What could cause us to do that much worshiping of one man? What on earth would make us worship one man forever and ever? That's the beauty of salvation. When you start opening up the Word of God, you start looking and focusing on the attributes of God. He's holy and He's just. And what did He do? And He provided a sacrifice to say, how can I not ignore Philip's sins but forgive him? He did it through Jesus Christ. You know, I've been written in the Lamb's Book of Life and we praise Him. And, you know, I didn't get to, to all of that I wanted to get and the types of Isaac and the types that we are. We need to understand today your need. I pray that God opens up your heart. I really do. We all do. We would love to see the Lord save, wouldn't we? We'd love to see the Lord call his sheep to himself. And it's not an embarrassing time, it's a rejoicing time. We rejoice, we celebrate when God calls one home. Because we know only God can do that. It's, you, you don't praise preachers for people walking down the aisle. If they're truly walking down the aisle, it's a God thing. If they're walking down because of a preacher, that's a bad thing. But when someone walks down the aisle and truly accepts Jesus as their personal Savior and God works within them, the godly sorrow, and then soon after that, the peace, once they trust Him as their personal Savior, saying, Lord, I don't want to perish, I don't want to die, I'm sorry, Father, for all the sin that I've committed against you. Would you please, please have mercy. That's all you can plead is mercy. You can't reason with God with anything other than asking God for mercy and to grant you forgiveness and that you believe that Jesus died in your place on the cross and that he rose again the third day and that he's one day coming back for his people and forever and ever will be home with the Lord. That's life. That's, that's the gift that he gives of life. That's the light we walk in today. Not just the light that we'll see when the Lord returns, but we walk in the light today because we are children of light. What a blessing. What an assurance. What, and it, isn't it sad some people don't have that? It breaks our heart, especially when people we love don't have that. We, we wait, don't we? We're waiting on the Lord. All we can do is pray. All we can do is be a testimony. All we can do is be an encouragement. We don't browbeat. We don't try to push people away. All we can do is preach and teach the truth of God's word. All we can do is sow the seed. And that's what we're to do faithfully. We're to faithfully sow the seed the way God instructed us to sow the seed. And then wait to see if the Lord will bring an increase. And when he does, it's all of God. It's all of God. And uh, that's all that I have this morning. I pray that the Lord has talked to your heart. What's your condition today? Uh, whether you're out there on Facebook, um, if the Lord has talked to your heart at all, you can certainly reach out and contact us. But at this time, uh, we are going to sing two lines of invitation. This is the time where uh, we as a church invite anyone to come forward who... The Lord's talk to. It could be about salvation. It could be about baptism. It could be about church membership. But uh, now is the time to come. As we all stand, Brother Green, Sister Harriet, if you please come forward, we'll have a song of invitation. <laughs>